Coming up next on Being Well, podiatrist Dr. John Killow will be here to discuss common foot problems and everything related to our feet, from flat feet to bunions to surgical options. That's all coming up next, so stay right here for this edition of Being Well. Dr. Killo, thanks for coming on Being Well. And we're talking about feet and all the problems associated with our feet, which is part of your practice. What are some of the most common things that you that people come in and complain about? It's everything from ingrown toenails to heel spurs to hammer toes to bunions. I see a lot of uh, uh, children with ingrowns. I see a lot of diabetics with uh, either nail care or diabetic foot ulcers. I see a, that's a big portion of my practice. So let's talk about what are the things that um, we're born with, like flat feet over pronation, that we really can't change. What are some of the common issues related to basically our foot architecture that okay. you can't? There's a lot of things that are related to foot architecture. Flat feet is a big one. You can actually get a club foot deformity that some children are born with. Oftentimes, feet run in families. So if, if grandma had a bunion, you're probably going to get a bunion. If grandma had a hammer toe, you're probably going to get it. Uh, I've treated four generations of ingrown toenails in the same family before. <laughs> Uh, that's probably the, the biggest one. Um, oftentimes people can, can actually end up with numbness of the feet. Uh, usually that doesn't show up till later on. You know, I, I treat everybody from the age of, of two weeks old to, to 104 is my oldest patient. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the foot deformities will develop as time progresses. In teenagers, I see a lot of athletes' foot, I see a lot of warts, I see a lot of uh, ingrown toenails. People hit their 20s and and 30s, I start to see the, the wear and tear type of thing mm -hmm. from, from lack of support of shoes. I start to see a lot of uh, heel spurs when a person, you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, heel spurs are, are also known as plantar fasciitis is very common in people uh, who wear the wrong shoes, mm -hmm. whether at work or walking around. Flip-flops are, are <laughs> not good for feet at all. <laughs> Those very, very flat shoes with no support. Correct. So before we get into the specific foot ailments, what are some things that we can do, preventative things that we can do so we don't have issues with our feet? Well, a big thing I see is most adults you know, will rarely look at the bottom of their feet. Uh, they jump in the shower, they wash down their knees, ah, the soap's getting down to there, so they're getting cleaned. And, and that's not true, especially in diabetic foot patients. They really need to check the bottom of their feet, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that they're, they're, they're between the toes are nice and clean and dry. Uh, make sure that you wear supportive shoes. Most people who step on something in their on underneath their foot actually step on something in their own house. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very important for a patient to wear shoes in their house. Um, oftentimes I'll see a person who has hardwood floors, for example, end up with heel pain because they're walking barefoot in their house. And mm -hmm. something very simple is just to, to wear shoes in the house. Okay. Uh, usually the more support on the shoe, the better. Uh, not necessarily the more expensive because oftentimes the price is based on uh, the maker of the shoe or okay. the style of the shoe. Uh -huh. So you brought some shoes. What makes for a good supportive shoe? Well, there are several things that make good support. Here, here's an, an example of a, uh, of a sandal. Uh -huh. uh, this is actually, you can get same flip-flop, but, but one thing you see is, is that the only place it really bends is in the toe region. Uh -huh. um, the toe region is the only place a shoe should bend. When, a sh when you pick up a shoe and, and turn it side to side, there shouldn't be much turn side to side in the shoe. Okay. And you also want to see a good arch support in the middle of the arch. Uh -huh. So you can still wear flip-flops or sandals. You can wear flip-flops and sandals as long as they have good arch support. Uh -huh. um, every spring I see a, <laughs> and usually at the end of summer, I see a lot of women who come in, they start walking barefoot at the beginning of summer and they've been wearing flip-flops all summer and by the end of summer their, heel, their feet are killing them. And something, sim something simple just a supportive pair of shoes will make a huge difference. Okay. Um, oftentimes I like the lace-up shoes better than the okay. Velcro shoes. This is a New Balance. I'm not a big fan of name brands but New Balance has made some very good shoes. Asics made some very good shoes. Uh, usually in Nike, not, nothing against Nike, but they, they really uh, sell their shoes more for kids. So you, you pay for the name, you don't necessarily pay for the shoe. Mm -hmm. Uh, once again, a shoe that doesn't have much bend, you want a, a rigid uh, heel at the back and, and not a lot of bend from side to side. Okay. And what about the, as a, you Here's said, a lace up shoes are, are lace up better? Lace up shoes are better. Uh, oftentimes, as people get older, they know just how tight their shoes need to be from slipping them on and on. Uh -huh. There's a reason they put laces. You can actually untie them, it'll make them uh, actually fit a lot better <laughs> when you tie them in a time. 
basically, in, in a basic shoe, you want a, a lot of patty in the toe region, a lot of support in the arch. You want a rigid heel counter, one that doesn't bend. Mm -hmm. Typically, when I tell patients, you know, they, they come in all the time, say, you know, I want to buy a shoe. What should I buy? Well, I don't know. What's best for you? you know, <laughs> but so I really can't say, okay, this is going to be the best shoe for you because not necessarily that, necessarily that way. Some uh -huh. pe people can't afford a hundred dollar pair of rock ports. They can't mm -hmm. afford a hundred and twenty dollar pair of of New Balance. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes they'll go to Walmart and they'll get a pair of uh, of shoes there. And as and oftentimes some of their shoes at Walmart are actually made very well. And I'm mm -hmm. not. I'm not telling you to go shop at Walmart, <laughs> but you know that's a very common thing that people do. And shoes wear out. You can't. You really. I know with athletic shoes, if you know you're supposed to replace them, you know every six months if you work out a lot because they do break down. Same thing that's for right. just your casual shoes, correct? That's right. Typically, for, for like a runner, for example, they recommend every 250 miles they should be changing a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. If you have a patient running five miles a day, that goes pretty quick. Right. Uh, for everyday use, as soon as you start to wear down the heel, it's time to change them. So, you know, every shoe has a tread in it. Once you start to get to where in any part of the shoe that you're below the tread line or you can't see where the treads used to be, uh -huh. it's time to change them. Yeah. Or if you're wearing off one side, it's very common. Uh, men, who, men, for example, who drag their feet, they'll wear off the outside of their uh -huh. shoe and, then, and they'll, they'll be walking and, you know, like this because their, their shoe on that side is so wore out. You also got to wash the top of the shoes. You know, oftentimes you'll wear them out to the inside, you wear them out to the outside. Depends on how, how you walk. And I think you can look at your shoes too and see if you're a pronate or under pronate Absolutely. or over pronate. Can you talk about pronation and what that well, is? Well, pronation is a uh, better way to say it is, is kind of a flat foot. You uh -huh. know, uh, it, when you walk wet foot after out of a shower, you should see the the heel. You should see the outside of the foot. You should see across the uh, across the ball of the foot, and you may see some of the toes. Mm -hmm. If you don't see what you call a typical footprint, it kind of looks like a inverted L, mm -hmm. where you're seeing just a straight bottom. That's a, that's a pronator. Mm -hmm. That's a flat foot. Um, you can actually get the opposite problem and get too high of an arch where when you do it, when you walk with a wet foot, the only thing you see is the heel and the ball of the foot, uh -huh. where the whole middle, middle of the foot doesn't even touch the ground. So if you have those extreme conditions, that causes a lot of foot pain. It does. And then you, what do you do to correct that? It depends on the problem. Uh, say they have a super high arch, oftentimes uh -huh. a surgery can be done to, to drop the arches down. Mm -hmm. Typically. When, when talking about deformities in children, if you can put a child's foot in the corrected position before their bones finish growing, mm -hmm. oftentimes their foot will grow into the corrected position. So orthotics, custom orthotics do, will help that quite a bit. Um, even, if, even just a really good structural over-the-counter orthotic can make a big difference for mm -hmm. that as well. Um, Surgery is always the last thing we try. We always try a lot of conservative things. A lot of the foot problems I see are oftentimes due to being tight in the Achilles. Okay. The Achilles tendon is the big ligament that runs down the back of your foot. And, and basically, the best way to say it, if you have a tight Achilles, it, may, it would cause you to be a toe walker. Okay. Well, when a person gets bigger, say, you know, in the human foot's really only made for about 200 pounds maximum. So when you have somebody that's, that's heavier than that, their arteries will oftentimes collapse and they'll collapse worse mm -hmm. based on how tight the Achilles tendon is. Okay. Does that, does plantar fasciitis come into that? Does that have anything to do with the Achilles tendon? It does. Okay, talk um, about what that is because I have a friend who suffers from that. Well, That's plantar it. fasciitis is extremely common. I use, I am starting to see it more in teenagers because a lot of them are overweight. Um, and basically, the plantar fasciitis, people wake up or they'll sit down for any period of time, they'll get up and they'll, and I call it walking like a 90 year old. Mm -hmm. They'll walk like a 90 year old for a little <laughs> while and then as they walk on it, it starts to ease off. It's always worse when they're barefoot. Uh, plantar fasciitis, it's usually the inside of the heel. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be the back of the heel. It can also be the outside of the foot. So, the, you know, they're, they're separate entities, but the whole bottom line is the tightness of the Achilles. Okay. When your foot relaxes, the, the Achilles tendon tightens up and you go to stand up and you, and, and what you're, the, the heel pain that people feel is actually tearing on that plantar fascia. Okay, so what kind of pain, if you think you may have plantar fasciitis, what, what are some of the telltale signs? Some people will say that it feels like they have a stone bruise in their heel. Uh -huh. Some people will say, uh, basically the bottom line is every time they sit down for longer than 20 minutes, they hate to get back up. Uh -huh. one, uh, but once they up, it starts to ease off. It's always worse when they're barefoot. Uh, some days are worse than others. Typically people, if, if it 
It can also get worse the longer you're on it. So say if you work for a factory job and you're on it for a couple hours, and a couple hours into work it starts to hurt again, mm -hmm. that usually means you need better support in your shoes. Okay. Oftentimes as adults, we, we jump out of bed, we hit the alarm clock, we hit the, <laughs> hit the floor running. Um, oftentimes um, we miss something very important, which is the stretching that you should do. You watch a baby, you watch an animal, the first thing they get up is they stretch. And, and as adults, we no longer do that anymore. Right. So what are some stretches? I've heard, um, you know, if you, have, you can roll a ball under your foot, like a golf ball, is that, what are some well, things you that's can do to okay. kind of stretch that out? Usually for people with heel pain, I will suggest uh, a frozen can of peaches. Uh, they can throw it in the freezer, let it freeze solid, uh, take it on the ground, put a sock on, on the peaches or a sock on themselves, uh -huh. and ice the bottom of their foot. Okay. Usually 15, 20 minutes twice a day does very well. The most important thing with plantar fasciitis is they need to stretch it out before they get up. Okay. Uh, one thing I, I often see is people will overstretch. Anytime you're stretching, you should never cause pain. If you're causing pain, you're tearing something yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, something I do, very simple, is a straight leg towel stretch where you loop the towel around the toes and just do a, a simple stretch your, back. Pull your, pull your foot back. put up. And, and, and the only thing you should feel is a, a stretch behind the knee. Uh -huh. um, that'll oftentimes make a, a big difference. Um, stretches up against the wall. Uh, the runner stretch is a very good mm -hmm. one. Or once again, the only thing you should feel when you stretch is a, is a stretch behind the knee. Okay. So is there any surgical treatment for plantar fasciitis or do you get orthotics? How do you treat that if the stretching doesn't well, help? Well, basically what I tell my patients is, you know, when I treat plantar fasciitis, I treat a lot of it. Uh, number one, I'm going to do least expensive, least painful work my way up as we have to. Mm -hmm. Typically on the first visit, I'll put them on stretching exercises and I'll probably fix 60% of patients simply on if I can convince them to do their stretching exercises. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the first come in, I got heel pain, and they think you're crazy, stretching exercise won't fix it, but when they, once they finally do it, they'll oftentimes see a tremendous difference. Uh -huh. um, actually, I've been practicing in Charleston now for over 10 years, and I have done no heel spur surgeries. Okay. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes, you know, there's, there's ways that you can do it on, on a second visit. If they're not any better, oftentimes I'll either offer an injection, I'll offer steroids, um, I'll offer, um, sometimes a night splint. A night splint will keep their foot in a stretched out position mm -hmm. while they sleep and oftentimes that'll make a difference. If that doesn't work, then we oftentimes we'll go with a uh, cam walker, like a basically a walking cast that you can remove. Okay. Well, let's talk about toenail fungus. Not very glamorous, but it's something, what causes it to begin with? And how well, do you know if you have it? Oftentimes, the, the cause is, is, is really, it's, it's, a, it's a fungus. And the funguses are typically uh, tropical and they like dark, warm, moist places. Uh -huh. There's no place finer than the inside of a shoe. Yeah. <laughs> um, it can start from athlete's foot. Athlete's foot can be the original source. Typically, most people who have fungus will have relatively sweaty feet. Um, so oftentimes, something as simple as just spraying your feet with Lysol, or not Lysol, with, with uh, right guard will decrease how much the feet sweat and you uh -huh. can oftentimes ruin the environment for the fungus. Okay. Something else I see is oftentimes, uh, a person, especially a woman, will, will wear polish just way too long. Uh -huh. Oftentimes you're better off to change it about every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, if the toenail is not perfectly clean on top and you have a little bit of fungus on there and you leave the polish on for too long, that's when the fungus jumps on top of the toenail and you get you remove the polish and you get me yellow, white yellow or white toenails on top. Uh -huh. um, oftentimes as a person can't reach their toenails as much, they're not, they're not as apt to keep them trimmed as close. The longer they grow, the more apt a fungus is to jump underneath mm -hmm. it. Oftentimes the toenail will curl more from side to side and that'll oftentimes yeah. predispose a person for... So what does toenail toenails. fungus typically look like in the nail? It can be anything from pure white to dark brown. Uh, usually, uh, most often it'll start in the big toes, sometimes it'll start in the little toe. Usually it's a thickening of the toenail. Mm -hmm. um, and actually if the toenail itself is unchanged, it's underneath the toenail. Okay. Um, so it, it can be very hard to, to treat. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes I recommend turning the toenail all the way back to where it's attached. That'll typically make a big difference on treating it. And there are some prescription medications you can prescribe for that? There's everything from the tablets, Lamisil tablets are, are very well known. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, you, you, I'm not sure if you've seen Dr. Oz, he recommends all kinds of things from, <laughs> from Vicks Vapor Rub to tea tree oil, and they do work. You know, the, the truth of the matter is oftentimes when you treat toenail fungus, you need to stay on top of it. It takes right. about nine months to a year for a toenail to go from the very back to the very front. Okay. So no matter how you treat it, you have to stay with it. Okay. So continuing on toenails, let's talk about ingrown toenails. Is that caused by the way we trim our toenails? Partially. Okay. And part of it is simply based on how the toenails grow. 
Okay. Typically an ingrown toenail, can be anything from tenderness on the side of the toenail, usually it's the big toenail, it's oftentimes the inside of the big toenail that's the worst. Uh, an ingrown toenail will be anywhere from pain, sometimes you'll get a lot of, uh, of uh, drainage from it, sometimes it'll be red, sometimes it'll be very swollen. So you can actually get a little growth of tissue along the side of it. Um, ingrown toenails are very common. I, I actually treated a two-week-year-old with ingrown toenails that never had a, their toenails <laughs> trimmed and never wear a pair of shoes. So you uh -huh. can't blame it necessarily on that. Okay. I've permanently removed ingrown toenails on, on well, my oldest was an 89-year-old. Mm -hmm. And he said that was the best procedure he ever had done. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, uh, my, my patient with ingrown toenails, I'll call my bathroom surgeons because they invariably will sit in the toilet and start cutting <laughs> their toes. <laughs> <laughs> so when you trim your toenails, I've always, I've heard, I don't know, maybe it's not true, that you, sh you should cut them off straight and not around the edges. Is that, that is better. Okay. Typically what I find is my, most of my patients are not very good self-abusers. <laughs> so if they go after an ingrown toenail, they usually get part way out. And they get uh -huh. part way out and it gets much worse because the, the bottom piece will actually dig into the skin while it grows out. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's move on to things like bunions. What okay. is, actually is a bunion and what causes it? Uh, a true bunion is the, the bump on the inside of the big toe. Okay. Okay. Uh, typically, it is a genetic issue. It runs in families. Uh, however, things that can make it worse are shoes that don't fit appropriately. Uh, oftentimes, high heel shoes will make things a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. they, typically, they will not be the cause of a bunion, but they will make them happen quicker. You have, you have bunions, which is the bump on the inside. You have a, a hallux limitus. Hallux means big toe where there's a bump on the top where the top of that joint butts against itself and oftentimes a person may have a lot of pain there. Hammer toes are when the toes are knuckled up. Um, there's three points of pressure points in hammer toes, the tips of toes, tops of toes, and across the, the tops of the metatarsals. Mm -hmm. um, those can be very painful. You have a tailor's bunny where the little toe turns to the inside, you have a bump on the outside of the foot. Okay. So is it like the bone, extra bone growing? Is it It's actually not the bone growing. Okay. It's the change in the orientation of a bone. In other words, with the bunion, if you can imagine this bone, as this bone moves out, this toe moves in. Oftentimes, the second toe will jump up to go over the toe or go <laughs> jump under. Um, so oftentimes with bunions, you see hammer toes as well. Okay. The, the true cause is a typically a tightness in the Achilles tendon and, and a uh, change in the pull of the tendons. Okay, so it seems like that Achilles tendon it sort of causes a important. lot of It patient. is a lot of problems. <laughs> Oftentimes, a lot of your really good runners in high school will develop foot problems as they get older. Mm -hmm. Well, let's spend the last uh, five minutes talking about diabetic foot care because I know that's a big part of your uh, practice. Um, why do diabetics have more foot problems? There's several reasons. Number one, diabetics, if they're running sh high sugars or they're running low sugars, they are, their body is less able to fight infection. Mm -hmm. The, the biggest thing is they oftentimes will lose feeling in their feet mm -hmm. um, and, and it oftentimes they'll start with burning, tingling, numbness and it'll progress to pure numbness. Um, I've had to do partial foot amputations with no anesthesia because they had they felt nothing. Wow. Oftentimes diabetics will, will simply walk a hole in their foot. When, right now if your foot hurts, you limp and, mm -hmm. and the, the onset of neuropathy, which is a very common term, will not cause a patient to limp and they will literally walk a hole in their feet. Uh, with the neuropathy, oftentimes will come peripheral vascular disease, which is the loss of the circulation going to the foot. So there's a lot of things. You know, typically what I see is, is you'll have a long-standing diabetic that, that doesn't take really good care of their diabetes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not until they have a, a, an event that they'll wake up and say, hey, I gotta take care of my diabetes. Um, but diabetic foot ulcers is a huge part of my practice. Oftentimes they can be prevented by simply wearing shoes in their house. Um, sometimes they can be prevented by, uh, by checking their feet daily. Checking okay. the feet daily is extremely important for a diabetic. And if you can't do it yourself, they should have someone else do it. Mm -hmm. Like, so what, were, what are some of the things that they should be looking for when they're checking their feet? Well, number one, you want to make sure the shoes fit appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my prime example is I had a patient come in and got a brand new pair of diabetic shoes mailed to him, and he came in with an ulcer on all of his toes, and, and he left the packing in. He didn't know that the packing was in there. So he had like four inches of packing in their shoe. <laughs> so I want to make sure that when a diabetic puts shoes on, make sure that they fit appropriately, make sure there's plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what I'll have my patient do is put their foot in a piece of paper, trace it, take their shoe and put their foot right on top of it. And if you see toes on both sides, too tight. <laughs> um, really non, or shoes that do not fit properly, the number one cause of most of your diabetic foot ulcers. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, 
I've seen diabetics step on something in their house that can be a cause of a diabetic foot ulcer. Oftentimes they'll start with a simple, something simple like a blister. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, the number one cause of diabetic foot ulcers and, and oftentimes if you can check your feet daily you can prevent a foot ulcer from developing. Okay. In these last few minutes let's just run through a checklist of things that we should be doing to keep our feet you know, pain free and healthy in general. Okay. Uh, the, probably the biggest thing for me is daily stretching is, is a huge difference. Uh, number two, wearing shoes that, that have good adequate support, mm -hmm. have good, good structure to them. Um, trimming the toenails correctly, keep, you know, keeping them between the toes clean is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, wearing shoes that fit appropriately. Yeah. Not those flat flip yeah, flops. Flip -flops uh, <laughs> Here oh, on, we're on a college yeah. campus, you see a lot of flip flops even in, in the middle I of do. winter. What about high heels? <laughs> I would not typically suggest anything over a two inch heel for, okay. for high heels. Okay. Um, and the more pointed the toe, usually the, the more it'll bother the hammer toes and the bunions and stuff like okay. that. Okay. And lastly, a lot of us women like to get pedicures. And you briefly talked about this about, um, you know, during sandal season, we all like to have our toenails polished. Mm -hmm. Is it a bad thing to keep polish on your toes? year round. Oh, really I recommend every two weeks. So just you take it have off? A change. Take it off at the end of the, um, in the, end of okay. the summer. Don't let it fall off on its own. <laughs> <laughs> but if you take it off does that mean leave it off for a while? Let your, cause you don't necessarily have to as long as you clean the nail thoroughly before you put the new polish on. Okay. All right. Well some good advice for uh, keeping our feet pain free hopefully and if you do have pain, you've got people like a podiatrist to, right. to help us out. Thank you so much, Dr. Killa, for coming on this show. We appreciate it. Thank you.